Hello and welcome to the Property Roundup here on iProperty Radio with myself, Carol Talent. The show where we chat to industry experts to get a view on activity on the ground and to learn about new trends emerging. This show is sponsored by DAF.ie, Ireland's most visited property website. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Johanna Murphy, a state agent with Johanna Murphy and Sons in County Cork. Johanna, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. Good morning, Carol. Thank you so much for the invite. Delighted to be here. Um, I am really excited to talk to you today because today is just a precursor to a conversation that you and I are going to be having on the main stage at the National Construction Summit in Blanchestown this Thursday. Um, so we, I, I'm so excited that I get the opportunity to speak to you in advance of that, but also that we'll really get to tease out some of the some of the bigger issues. Um, I'm a huge advocate of regional development and understanding what's going on across the regions. Um, and so I'm really excited to learn a little bit more about some of the parts of County Cork that I mightn't be so familiar with. So let's talk about maybe outlining the geography where you're working at the moment. OK, so, Carol, I've been involved in the property industry for the bones of 30 years. Um, I predominantly my, my office is in Cove, but I work all over County Cork. In actual fact, you could find me. I sold a house in Longford last year, um, which we'll discuss in a while, the power of social media. But yeah, so it's County Cork. I'm from the city myself, married a Cove man, hence I'm living in Cove. And Very I love good. what you have to say. Very good. And um, so, well, actually, let's let's start with the power of social media, because, yes, we're going to be get, I want to talk about the local marketplace. But actually, um, I I, I, I've known you and, and your business um, for a long time, uh, such as the nature of this industry. But social media has really changed how involved we can get in, in following the properties that have been listed and things like that. So um, let's let's talk about that as to maybe around your business, how because you obviously are operating quite independently. How important is digital for you? OK, so I suppose if we go back to COVID, really, that's kind of where it started for me, because obviously we couldn't do viewings. And with the nature of where I live, we have a lot of international buyers do come to Cove. So mm -hmm. I said, you know, how am I going to show these houses to to these people abroad? Very amateur, not comfortable in front of the camera, didn't like any of that. So how it started with was me just doing a video in the car or just showing a house or what I did, which I thought was really, really good, is that I did a tour of Cove. So I did a tour of Cove because if you say to any auctioneer, yes, you can sell a house, but you've got to sell the location where the house is. And that's what I really learned, right? So I embraced social media. I saw the reaction I was getting. People were loving it. People love going into people's houses, nosy to have a look, right? The virtual tours, the videos, they wanted to see, you know, how, how was I feeling about the property? Was I excited about it? Did I like it? Um, and then it kind of just grew from there. And then it became so big that I had to employ a marketing consultant to help me because I'm on every social media platform. So, and I keep, and the trick is it has to be constant in mm -hmm. the sense you've got to do this every a couple of times a week. You've got to be, um, your, your content has got to be interesting. It's got to be snappy. It's got to be short. It's got to be colorful. It's got to be engaging. Um, it's got to have a variety so that, you know, people can see me at an event. Um, it could be a women's networking event. It could be a business event. It could be in my wellies and wax jacket going into a dive of a house that needs so much work. I have great insight, too, as if I see a ruin of a house as to what it could be. And you, I love old houses anyway. Um, I also love to help the first time buyer. Right. Mm -hmm. That's kind of for me, I suppose, because I've got three boys now and one day they're going to hopefully buy a house that I can see that no matter you can be shouting from the rooftops what they need to do. But you know what? They still don't know. And when they can gravitate and feel that you're going to mind them, they're going to love that. But yeah. also the person that bought the house 40 years ago that is now in their late 60s, early 70s, looking to downsize, they don't know how to buy a house now. They don't know how to bid in a house. You're trying to help them. You're trying to steer them the way. So I always say to someone, the minute they pick up the phone to me, they're with me. I'm with them on that journey to the day they hand their keys over or they get their keys. And, and that really is important. I, I, I think that's so powerful. And the fact that you're you're working um, in, a, in a set area uh, from Cove, but servicing all of County Cork uh, over the bones of 30 years. Have you found that you are now selling homes for people 
that maybe you might have helped them to purchase? One hundred percent. I've seen a cycle actually of of three times, okay. and I now have people's kids coming to me because they bought a house off me, right? And but you know what? I think you know life as an auctioneer, you evolve over time. Remember, I started when I was only I'm fifty three now, nearly right. I started when I was twenty three. I was probably one of the youngest female auctioneers around. Yeah, and I'm very different now to what I was then, right? I've learned so much um, and it has evolved and auctioneering has evolved and it is a very tight ship now. You have to run a very, very tight business from a CPD, um, making sure that you have all your paperwork organized and even having the regulatory authority body there, I think mm. is a good thing. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, selling a house is it's, it's probably one of the biggest things you'll ever do. And, it, and you're being entrusted to do that. So that's a big deal. Um, it's really interesting when you talk about your journey and maybe the age you were when you start. And the reason I'm interested, I'm, I'm kind of laughing to myself because only in the last couple of weeks I, introduced, or I interviewed a man and he was saying, you know, and I was one of the youngest estate agents setting up. And I said, really? He said, yeah, I was only 35. And I, I was saying, over the last 20 <laughs> years, all of my network of female um, uh, estate agents who own their own practice all started um, in their 20s, some under 25, uh, maybe some just over 25, but around that age. And it was really interesting to hear this man think that he was so uh, yeah. that he was so young, starting at 35. And it made me realize, actually, there's a huge disconnect uh, maybe from the next generation of, of uh, agency owners understanding how the players who are there now got started. Um, so there's what? definitely it, a disconnect. And you know what? It's it's not easy. It, I mean, when I say journey, it has been a journey with a lot of ups and downs, right? And a lot of frustrating. And sometimes you love auctioneering and sometimes you don't. And you think, oh, I just want to get out of this. But it always comes back to the client. You can, you've, I've met amazing people. I really have. And when I, I don't care if it's, if it's a property for 150 grand or if it's a house for 5 million, I still have that sense of, you know what? They've just got their house. Mm -hmm. They've just got their home. And also people who want to invest, who want to realize a dream, buy a piece of land, get it zoned, get planning, build their houses. Brilliant. And yeah. actually, you know, something funny just came to me there when you were just speaking about the guy who thought he was the youngest guy, right? My mom, she was the first woman auctioneer in Ireland to hold her own license and run her own business, right? And Tommy, Yeah. And Tommy Barker, who is the property editor for the examiner forever, yeah. right? It was so funny. He said, you know what, Joanna? I remember your mother used to get you up into the office on a Saturday and I used to take maybe you used to take the photographs and they'd get the pick and then we'd stick the photograph onto a brochure right piece of paper where my mother was very theatrical with her writing and it was always a dramatic story and Tommy said Joanna just used to be thrown in the door and with the photograph with the writing and then we just have to make it all out and put it on the examiner and they just it was brilliant and that's how things have changed you know so you know, uh, things change, but some things stay the same. I'm really glad that you gave Tommy Barker, uh, property <laughs> editor in The Examiner, a shout out there because only in very recent months, uh, Tommy has been a huge advocate for us over the past number of decades. And only the last few months he got to meet my daughter, who's part of the oh, business great. and producer of the show here. So he is now kind of helping the next good. generation as it comes. So good. he has... He is a he has a strong uh he has strong form in helping multi generational uh female. Oh, he's amazing. So, and he's so good man. <laughs> so supportive. Um. So, but look, uh, I think it's really interesting when you talk about uh the the home buyers and you see that cycle. Um. But where are we right now? Because look, the uh, you know with with all of the different reports coming out, whether it's on the property prices, rental prices, or indeed construction or construction outputs. Um, you know, it's not always easy to understand. And I think sometimes uh, the reporting definitely suffers from a bit of a Dublin outside of Dublin um, narrative. And that's not very helpful in the regions. So talk to me, please, about who's what's happening in the in the County Cork marketplace um, in terms of supply and demand. Where are we in terms of supply? Is County Cork suffering from the same experience that we're seeing right across the country in terms of very slow turnover of secondhand properties and you know so what's the marketplace like okay so um 
Well, first of all, supply for me, the, the supply is always trickling in, right? But, it, you know, obviously the problem with the supply is that when you get a house for sale, it is gone in a week or two. Yeah. So therefore your supply is diminishing all the time, yet your demand is rising all the time, right? So I predominantly deal in secondhand houses and secondhand houses now, I can see, this is what I can see. I can see that people are very aware that if there's a house that needs work, for them to be able to do up that house, it's going to cost them a lot of money to do up that house because mm -hmm. trades people are expensive, construction is expensive, right? So, but still they're going to pay a bit more than what you're going to ask for it. And then you have the the energy rate now, and we'll come into this in a while. Energy rating is really important. So if a house is an energy rating of A or B, people love that because then their domestic bills for electricity and heat and electricity are going down, right? Whereas if they have an older house, they're not. They have to retrofit them and they have to make them more sustainable, which is very expensive, which again, we can talk about in, in time, right? So I suppose I'm seeing the business is so busy for me in the last three years. It's gone up and up and up. My turnover has gone up and up and up. And it's because the amount of people now who want to buy a house has increased. What I do find, and I mean, I I, I see this and, and it's been well said on the paper, is that unfortunately, the state are buying up a lot of land a lot of and 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 building it out for social housing and institutions are buying up that land and building out for social housing which is leaving very little then for the nurse working walking working down the road the junior doctor the guardy you know working someone working in the shop mm -hmm. i think there was a figure of something like 94 percent of houses last year or this year what last year this year were built were, were for were for apartments for social housing and mm -hmm. were bought up by the state or institutions which left then six percent for that other time for the other buyer yeah but there but there's a larger piece to that conversation like we talk about supply and demand and i think um uh, a, a home builder local to you um you know michael flynn he's yeah. generally very good at kind of drawing the distinction between demand and qualified demand yeah you know so he, he would make the point everybody wants to buy a home not everyone can afford to buy a home in their area or can access a mortgage that would enable them to buy a home in the area that they want or the yes. type of home in the yes. area that they want so actually, when we look at the, the counter court marketplace that you're looking at there and we break down demand versus qualified demand, um, you know, the, the supply of new of homes, the type of stock coming in is one thing. But the reality is, if there was qualified demand, it would make construction projects more viable. So where is the disconnect? Um, is there a disconnect between the salaries people are making, the expectations that they have, the availability of zone land to be able to deliver homes or is it? Uh, it's simply a case there aren't enough home builders looking to deliver, um, you know, in, in uh, across the county. Well, I think there's a, there's an array of different reasons. First, obviously, people's salary, the cost of houses now, brand new houses, crazy money. Mm -hmm. And then you have interest rates. So recently I was on I, I was being interviewed about this particular question. Right. And what I say to anybody who wants to buy a house you must think outside the box. You're not always going to be able to buy a new house, right? So therefore, you must buy a second-hand house. Mm. And let's say I had a house there only recently, 190,000, needs a lot of work, sold the house for 240,000 to a young couple who are going to avail of the uh, vacant home grant. They are, they, he's a bit of a handyman himself that he can go away and do a bit of the work himself. And yeah. I said, guys, I remember when I moved into my first house, I had a kettle. It's, you can't have I think a lot of people want the Instagram house now yeah. straight away this is called the the property ladder so you buy your, your first house is not your forever home buy it do it up sell it in a couple of years time acquire a bit of equity and buy another house for your maybe your family you're going to have that house and then down the road you're going to sell that to downsize to when you don't need such a big house um, and it, also it's really important Carol that yeah. whoever buys a house and I say this I said once you are on a public transport system 20 to 30 minutes from the city or from your job that is crucial yeah. so location is everything uh, well I, and actually that doesn't when we look at public transport that doesn't take in all of County Cork at all no, as, I'm, no. as I'm very well aware um, but I suppose one of the things I'm a little nervous about is this concept of uh, the property ladder and the starter home because I think actually the last decade and a half have taught us that actually you can get caught in your starter home and it can be it can really be detrimental to your life and I know um, you know for people who bought uh, uh, just before the crash 
thinking they were going into a starter home, particularly if these were small apartments, you know, they found themselves in a, a really unfair position where they've had to uh, rent out their own home because they can't uh, sell their apartment because it might be negative equity. They've had to rent a family home maybe that would uh, better cater to the needs of their growing family or the stage they're at in their life. But they've been treated like investors. So as in they're, they're taxed on the full income that they that they uh, earn from the or, you know, so they're essentially losing 52 percent of what they're making on their their starter home flat. That's a negative equity while still having to pay very high rents while not having the ability to save for um their, their second mortgage. And, you know, so I feel that actually people who maybe got caught in starter homes over the past 15 years would have. You know, the concept of a property ladder feels very risky to them. And I, I, I wonder, is this why more and more people are looking at these derelict and vacant homes and thinking, OK, there's a lot of work needed, but there's space around it. There's space exactly. for me to grow as opposed to if I go into a three bed or even a, a two, two and a half bed townhouse. Like, it, for example, a three no bedroom space. semi, I think a, bra a brand new three bedroom semi, I think is up to like 380,000 at the moment. Mm. That's crazy money. Yeah. So, yes. And you know what? I suppose for every property, there's property cycles, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, my mom was telling me in the 80s or it was at 18% interest rates on properties. I mean, that was on mortgages. It was crazy. Yeah. So now we're at what? Four or five percent, three percent, whatever. And now they're thinking of fixing it and hoping the rates will come down. I just think that you should not buy a house if you cannot. You've got to forecast your figures for at least five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. Can you afford to buy that house? And if anything, what has taught us with the boom is that we have to learn at that. We have to learn what if there's a rainy day? What if the rates go up? What if the property goes down? Can we still maintain that mortgage? And this is why I say to the to the first time buyer um, or whoever buys a house, buy, you know, buy it according to what you can afford to buy it for. And mm. if you can do a bit, a bit of work yourself or you can do a direct labor or you can do maybe one room at a time, not do it all at the one time. Yeah. Take, you know, I did that, Yeah. you know, and it worked. So um, I'm, I, I, I'm not even going to uh, load on the, the generation of instant gratification. <laughs> I think they get an awful hard time. But there is an element of uh, cutting your cloth and maybe something that might at some point have been a more... Uh, um, a more acceptable it, it was the the uh, approach to buying a home or starting something that you were going to be uh, doing for the rest of your life I mean one thing I see with my own friends uh, and my own friend circle you know once they hit about 12 to 13 years in the same home they suddenly start to see their kitchen and their bathroom differently and it's usually because they've had young children those children are now growing up and just the needs differ so essentially whatever home you go into as you evolve as your life and your family and your needs evolve. That is house. That home is going to have to evolve over time, irrespective of where it is. Um. So I think that that's a, that's a big consideration. We're talking about, um. You know, the people who are in the marketplace maybe to buy, but it's it, those people need homes to be able to buy. And if they're not new homes, then they're going to be secondhand. But for those secondhand homes to come on the market, we need the sellers to know where they're going. So the people you're going into in terms of who are asking you to value their homes at the moment. So the people, the homeowners, um, and they're considering selling, but maybe nervous that they might not find the right property. Um, what What's the sentiment for the home buyer or sorry, the home uh, owners that you're going in and meeting who are just thinking that they would like to trade up or trade down or move closer to uh, a town or something, but um. You know, th that's a really uncertain, it's it's a really uncertain okay. place to be in at the moment. Okay, so that is your, that for me is, I even say it's probably a one to two year journey cycle. Mm. So from the time that that person will pick up the phone, um, they've, they've, they have obviously been thinking about it for a couple of months previous. Now they've picked up the phone to ring Joanna to come down and see what, it, what, what the whole process entails. Um, they're not going to sell their house unless they have a house to go to. And you can't expect them to. Why mm. would they do that? But unfortunately, if somebody is is looking to downsize or upsize and they see a house that they like, some agents, due to because of the seller, wants the buy the, the buyer to be mortgage approved or a cash buyer not be in a chain, mm -hmm. it really sometimes that's just not fair because 
I wouldn't want to sell my house unless I knew I had a house to go to, right? So generally what happens is that, now to be fair, most clients are very happy to do, um, but to be in a chain, you know, provided. And so if I go into a house and I see that, oh, that this house now, I'm going to sell it, no problem. It's going to be fly out the door within two or three weeks and they have their interest in another house that I'm selling. I will be very honest with them and the buyer of the, and the seller of the other house. Yeah, do you know what? I can sell their house. They've given you a good offer. Let's give it a month now, get it on the market and get an offer and see how we get on. And do you know what? No pressure. I take the pressure from both of them, both yeah. sellers. I'm taking all that stress away from them to get them into where they need to be. So it's showing a bit of compassion, a bit of re realism, you know, it's and 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 the price has got to be right. There's so many different factors. But for me, the most important thing is that they do not feel stressed. They do not feel forced. It's a big decision. It's a lot to take in, no matter whatever buyer it is. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So I just suppose it is a journey. And as I said, it's a two year, it's a one year, two year journey. And I've been on that journey with so many people. And I always say, you know what? You picked up the phone to me today and you're so nervous and you're dreading leaving your house. But I guarantee you, the minute you leave this house, you'll be running out the door to your new house and it's a new chapter in your life. So it's brilliant. I, I that, That's a lovely approach. And I think that's a very fair way to approach it as well um, for people, because acknowledging that while you do this every day as your day job, they don't. And mm -hmm. actually, there's a huge emotional as well as the logical side of it. Yeah, and that's yeah. always more difficult to navigate. Um, well, I suppose then looking ahead, um, you know, where do you see your pipeline of homes coming for um, over the next over the next kind of year to 12 or a year to 18 months? Um, is there a pipeline of new homes now coming on stream? Are you expecting that to, to free up some of the second hand homes? Are you expecting changes in terms of the grant structure for vacant and derelict homes? Now, a proposal has been made that these that payments could be made by way of stage payments, which would make it more accessible. Absolutely. People. So where do you see your pipeline coming over the next year to 18 months? OK, so I think that there's a lot of people moving around and I think remote working has had a huge um made a huge difference to people to be able to do that. So I would have a lot of people, first of buyers are obviously, well, predominantly moving to the likes of Cove because we have a fantastic public transport system. So they can get the train, they can get the bus, they can move down here and buy a more affordable home than possibly in the city, right? They can go to Mallow, they can go to, um, I don't know, Kinsale is a bit out of reach, but, and then people from a re remote working can move to Kerry, they can move to West Cork, they can move anywhere, right? Once they can get to the city within reason. And then you have the people who are down sizing who you know unfortunately obviously people pass away and then houses come up for sales and then those houses become available be the derelict or be it smaller and then people can move into that so there's an array of buyers I'm continuously seeing a flow of properties coming in right but um obviously I'm in a smaller demographics here in Cove but I see it in the city too um can sale is a different kettle of fish that's more the international buyer um is there new developments coming on stream yes there is but we're going to have from and this is where we probably talk more about this on Thursday. We have a huge infrastructural issue here in this in this country regarding new developments. And I'm talking from uh, I'm from a water perspective, connection to Irish water. I'm talking from mm. a grid perspective, from a because as we become become more electrified, we're going to need more electricity. We're going to need a better grid system. So, this, but infrastructure, and we're going to need better roads to get into these estates and. So there's just an array of things to be considered when new developments are going ahead, right? But I just think that the, every single person needs and deserves a home, be it a property they can buy or be it a property that they can rent. But at the moment, property, I feel some of the properties becoming unaffordable for people and rents are sky high, which is really unfair. So, you know, but then, of course, then you have the investor who has the property and wants to make the money. And I'll ask you, look, it's just it's a bit of a vicious cycle. So, well, like genuinely, everything that I'm seeing across um, non-institutional landlords, they are not making money out of the high rents. No. So I, I think that that's kind of maybe the first myth to. to well, kind of well they're, they're making money if they don't have a mortgage. Right. Uh, 52 percent taxation is is 
ridiculous for something 100%. that is not a passive income. It is very much a hands-on income. Uh, I don't know any landlord who would consider the income that comes. But that's from not what I meant. What, what I meant yeah. is that I'm just saying that they've got high rents. But yeah. what I'm saying to you is that the landlord has to charge the high rents in order yeah. to cover their costs, which are extortionate when you're yeah. renting the property. That's, yeah. I suppose, the angle I was taking. Yeah. And I mean, that's a whole other subject, the whole rental market, which is, for me, on its knees, yeah. if you like we're we're as a country encouraging companies to come into this country to work and invest here. I mean, the other day I had a phone call from a company. I have 70 employees, Joanna, coming in to um to Cork. Can you house 70 employees for me? Yeah. Yeah. And actually, the interest one, the corporate lets is one we're hearing from estate agents right across the country, irrespective of how rural it is. Only last week we spoke to Tommy Carmody in North Kerry, kind of on the North Kerry Limerick border. We had a similar conversation with Kevin Curran on the rural Galway to, to Mayo border. And, and they all have the same, they all kind of are, are experiencing the same situation. And just in terms of um, you know, I, I I think the rental market in Ireland is so broken that it is only going to get worse before it gets better. But one thing for sure is, you know, um, these rent caps actually, uh, you know, at a time when inflation was running between six and eight percent and landlords being capped at at two percent never made sense. Um, so we didn't encourage landlords to stay in the marketplace. And even the IMF in the, the last fortnightly visit that they had and they flew over to Ireland they reiterated what they reiterate every time they come over to Ireland which is rent caps are making our rental situation worse every yeah. every um economic indicator tells us that all of the data tells us that and it is I, I suppose populist politics that keeps that in play and to me that's so insulting for the community for citizens to to think that they won't understand that actually if we drive investors out of the market, if we drive the people who have the supply of homes out of the market, then we have less supply and therefore the cost is going to go up. To think that the average person on the street doesn't understand that, I think is really condescending of our politicians. So um, I, I think our rental market is at the point where actually we need some really brave political action that is following the data, that's following good economic advice, that's actually you know that's going to be unpopular for politicians perhaps or difficult for them to explain but actually worth the journey to get there because it means that we might actually start building our way towards a functioning rental market um, but we won't do that without uh, an amount of political bravery and it's difficult to see that happening in well, just has a to political be cycle we're in yeah, but there just has to be incentives for the investor mm. to come into the market. So therefore, we can get like the investors are not there now. You have very few investors buying rental property yeah. to rent out because it's of no one. It's no no incentive for them to do that, right? Unless they get it for half nothing, which doesn't happen, right? So therefore, what we need to do, uh, we have to incentivize the investor to buy the properties. So therefore, there's a rental supply there. Mm. Because as I said, we have an array of people who, some people want to buy a house, some people are happy to rent a house. Then we have people coming to this country who need yeah. to rent a house because they're working for a company and they might only be here for three yeah. years. And why would they buy a, but, you know, why would they buy a property? The rent capital um, system is antiquated. It needs to be sorted. Um, our, our rental system is broken. If I put a property up for rent, yeah. on that, I can promise you, I will have at least a thousand emails within 24 to 48 hours. So, which is yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. And everyone has a story, Carol. You know Everyone has a story and it's yeah. hard to choose, you know, who's the right person. You know, you talk about you talk about incentivizing landlords. I mean, we were talking about that maybe five, six years ago. At this point, I think a good start would be to stop disincentivizing mm. landlords, stop disincentivizing the people who are trying to solve the problem at the moment. But look, I, I, I yeah. fully appreciate that's kind of part <laughs> of the larger conversation for another day. But yeah. look, w one of the things that I'm really excited to talk to you about at the National Construction Summit in Blanchetown on Thursday is um, you do something that we advocate for here on the show all the time. And that is in an era of digitalization where estate agents can feel, uh, you know, in some cases with the rise of prop tech, we have seen people feel somewhat threatened or somewhat trying to understand where their value sits. And to me, the the value of an estate agent, particularly an independent estate agent across the regions, is advocating for their place. And you touched on it in the first few minutes of our interview here about how important it is that, you know, it, it's not just that you're doing walkthrough properties of the videos you're selling. You're actually showcasing the towns, the communities in which you're selling as well. And to me, that's 
become a bit of a lost art across estate agents. Um, so how important is that aspect for you? Well, the first thing I always think anyway is it's always nice to give back, right? That's the first thing. And um, I've been an estate agent for on my own for the over 20 years, but in the business 30 years. And I've learned an awful lot that it's all very well to get a house for sale. But you got to sell, you got to sell where that house is. Yeah. Where is that location? And that's why, as, as I said to you, when I first started um, embracing all the social media and I did a tour of Cove, I saw like 60,000 views within the space of a week. Right. Because yeah. people said, I didn't realize there was um, six schools and Cove on and, and soccer stadium and a rugby and sailing and what's going on. And I really I kind of said, you know, what? I have something here. So I then started working on that. So everywhere I sell a house, I walk, could be walking down the town, I can sail, I could be in Cork City. And then every post I put up, you know, Cove is popular because we have a public, a really good public transport system, a train, we have a bus service, and then we have the cruise season start from a tourism perspective. These are all the different restaurants you can go to. And then as a result of me embracing all that is when then four years ago, I got involved in Cove and Harbour Chamber. I'd always been involved in the sailing clubs at Cove and, you know, did all that and loved it. And then I went into Cove and Harbour Chamber, which is all business related. And I got to see then, you know, I can actually make a real change here. I have access now to make a change. And I think I was always bursting to do it, but I was very shy to do it and I didn't know how to go about it. And to be fair, I all I had to do was ask for help and people were so helpful and people jumped on board with me and we all worked together and Whilst I was president um, for the two and a half years, I learned so much and I was able to, to deliver so much. And that's where I took on and embraced the whole renewable energy sector within our harbour. I saw that, I, as I mentioned to you before, like the pharmaceutical industry came to the harbour in the 80s. It was the 90s, I can't remember. And it was so scary for the community. They didn't understand, is this going to affect our harbour? You know, are we are we going to be polluted out of it? Is yeah. there going to be too much industry? My word, did it change how the harbour looked? We have better schools, more houses. Everywhere had to eat, sleep and drink somewhere. We have better roads. Employment was massive. And then, so I looked at then the whole renewable energy sector and said, hang on a second. This is just exactly what happened in the 80s. It's going to happen here now, but it's on a bigger scale, right? So that's then, I suppose, my whole mantra for, for when I was president, that I really embarked on that. And I said, guys, we have a massive opportunity here. Cork Harbour has always been an energy hub. Now we have all the key components in place. And by that, what I mean is that we have the Port of Cork, we have Doyle Shipping, which was the, the boat yard, the shipping yard here in Cove. Um, we have the Nautical Mar the National Maritime College of Ireland. We have um, the oil refinery, all of them, right? Who are all looking to progress through to renewable energy. So if you were to go to another harbour or another town or another port that don't have part of this built out already, you've got yeah. to start from scratch. Whereas yeah. now we can build out what we have and start and this is and when and people saying well you know do you want how is this going to benefit us i said guys it's like this energy security by us producing our own energy in this country country we are have we are in control of our own energy our pricing the community enhancement um will be marvelous again we'll see more schools more houses better infrastructure but the best thing of ever is employment yeah our own People who have had to leave this country to get a job in that sector can now come home with a wealth of experience that we can now embrace. We have our kids coming up the tracks who can um, go into the Maritime College to be upskilled. We have our Navy who have an expertise and wealth of expertise within the maritime sector can now go to the Maritime College and be um, be upskilled as well. So it's just, it's phenomenal. And we're going to need um, administration. You're going to need offices. And when I look at it and I look at the, the harbour with all the different communities around the harbour, well, there's going to have to be offices for the people. There's going to be houses that they're going to have to live in. They're going to have to eat somewhere. They're going to have to shop somewhere. And this then might open up the whole harbour to connect. You know what I mean? That you yeah. have all the different villages that they can connect now. So, yeah. And, you know, I suppose... From because I'm big into sailing and I love all the the recreational side and leisure side of the maritime world, there has to be a happy medium. There has mm -hmm. to be a happy medium between commercialism and um, leisure. 
which mm -hmm. there will be, right? And you see it in a lot of ports and a lot of countries, right? So we can do the same here and we have been managing that quite successfully for decades now. So I'm quite convinced with the right people involved and, you know, relaying that information on a layperson term mm -hmm. that they understand the terminology is really key to it big time. Yeah, I, look, it goes beyond understanding the terminology. It's <laughs> understanding the opportunities, as you very yeah. rightly pointed out, the yeah. fact that um, every new job created is somewhere that, that somebody's going to have to live. There's somebody who is going to have to go to a restaurant to eat, somebody who may have children that want to support a local school. So it's it's the, the ability to join up the dots. But for me, it goes even to the heart of, to my mind, what an estate agent or an auctioneer is, which is an expert on their local place. Properties, individual properties come and go. Their trends, you know, uh, buyer trends, buyer expectations evolve. But the place, the place is where is kind of the seat of the expertise. And to me, um, to me, that's what estate agents and auctioneers were decades ago. And that that's that's we'd love to see them almost reclaim that now because so much of the process of buying and selling a home can be done digitally and while there's a huge uh, human element as well to to focus on the emotional side and the non-logical side of the buying and selling decisions the reality is it does come back to place so if we can not just help tell people about the place but you're going a step deeper and actually help them shape the place I think that's really influential yeah so well I want to like you want to someone said to me like Cove they become more cosmopolitan because you have more people moving to the country now like I was walking down town the other day in Cork City and the amount of nationalities that I was listening to was phenomenal, which yeah. means that we're doing something right. And yeah. I always think that if your town looks good and you're if you're helping to make it be better all the time, right, I have a better chance of selling a house down here and getting people down to Cove. 100%. And that for me is so important that I sell Cove. I love Cove. I love Cork. I love Kinsale, that I can sell it. And you know what I was actually saying to um just before I move on, just even the type of buyer over the last five or six weeks, I have sold to four American families. Yeah. Coming to Ireland. Are they relocating? Relocating. And I said, why, why, like, why are you relocating? Why are you coming here? I'm always yeah, interested to know yeah. why are they moving here, right? And number one, it's from a job perspective. Number two, mm -hmm. our quality and way of life. Yeah, we have a great way of life in this country. Yeah. and I suppose we're actually very well situated in Europe too because we can yeah. go anywhere, which is yeah. really good. From a, from a, a, I suppose working remotely and being able to fly over to the UK or you know yeah. over to the states or whatever. So it just is very accessible. And um, there was another couple that just recently bought a house off me, retirees, and they were so nice. And they just said, you know, Joanna, we just, we see a Cove on social media and we just want to be here. It's amazing. You know, and it's like, I, I, you know what I, do, first, I, I, I do feel that you're operating at a geographical advantage there from Cork <laughs> or from Cove as well. And um, we, we have to, we have to acknowledge that. Yeah, you know, I know, you I definitely know. are in, yeah. well, wasn't uh, Cove voted Ireland's most Instagrammable town. So you possibly, definitely... possibly, but um, um, yeah, you know what? It's just, look, you just kind of think outside the box all the time. Absolutely. Um, Jan, I, I absolutely love your passion for place and your passion for property. And I think you bring those together. And I love that you're doing it in a way that's actually influencing uh, the shape of the town and and the opportunities that can come out of that. And I'm really excited to sit down with you um on Thursday at the National Construction Summit. We'll be on the main stage Thursday morning. So anybody who's attending the National Construction Summit and is really interested in getting some in-depth uh, knowledge about kind of the, the pipeline of the market uh, right across the regions in Cork, but there's, there's a whole host of other activities um and discussions there. So please join us at the National Construction Summit in Blanchetown on Thursday. Um, and Johanna, I look forward to speaking Thank to you, you so much. In, in person, to in person Absolutely. on Thursday. Absolutely. That was, Thank that you. Was, uh, no problem at all. My pleasure. That was Johanna Murphy, estate agent with Johanna Murphy and Sons uh, down in Cove. My thanks as always to producer Katie Tallon and to the production team at Hear Me War Media. Also, huge thanks to our show sponsor, uh, DAF.ie, Ireland's most visitor property website. And thank you indeed for tuning in. We'll catch you on the next episode of the Property Roundup. In the meantime, please be sure to check out all of the other Irish and international real estate and construction shows here on iPropertyRadio.com.